time now for Inside Utah Politics. Hey, thanks for joining us, everybody. I'm Brian McElhatton. Let's go inside Utah politics today. A new survey detailing what issues Utahns care most about. And today, Christopher Collard, the research director at the Utah Foundation, joins us. Thanks for being here. Oh, thanks for inviting me. So we're going to talk about the Utah Foundation's 2024 Utah Priorities Project Report. And this gives us a snapshot, Christopher, of the things Utahns care about the most, what's on their mind what they're worried about. Why do you think this is important to document? Well, we, we think this is important to know because, first of all, we want to let politicians know what's most important to Utah voters. Um, but it's also important for us as an organization so we can go out and we can kind of collect information about these issues so we can help make sure that Utahns are informed voters when, they're, when, you know, when they take these poli policy positions and actually um, act on them by choosing who to represent them. So we're going to go through the data here in a moment, but first, how did you collect the data? How did you compile it? Tell me about the methodology here. Yeah, you bet. So this is actually just a, a couple of surveys. The first one's really simple. We ask you know, Utahns, Utah voters specifically, uh, when thinking about what do you want the governor to do? What's the t most important issue for you? And they come back with all sorts of, of ideas and recommendations, and we go through and we kind of categorize them, and we came up with about 50 different categories, and we took like the top, the most important of those, it turned out about 17 issues. And again, we take that back out in another survey, and we, we ask voters to prioritize those issues. Um, but 17 issues, that's kind of a big list to go through and, and order. So what we do is we kind of break it down into groups of four. Um, and we ask, you know, what's your top issue? What's your bottom issue among this group of four? And we just kind of iterate doing different combinations so that we can kind of put together uh, a list of, of what and prioritize which issues matter most to Utahns. Well, let's get into those issues. You've categorized the most important, high importance, and important. So yeah. they're all important they're, to the voters. Well, right. we, there's, there's even more after that, kind yeah. of a middle importance and low importance. But definitely the, the ones I want to talk about today are definitely those, those high important issues. And we have them for you here on your screen. So let's show you the most important issues, housing affordability, and politicians listening to the voters. Let's start with housing affordability and what you learned there. I'm sure, I'm sure it doesn't really surprise anyone at all that this is one of the top issues for Utahns. I mean, yeah. Utah's house pricing, Utah's, the prices of Utah houses have is sky, really skyrocketed over the past um, few years, and, and people are really feeling the pinch on that. Yeah. Uh, politicians listening to voters. They, they, they don't seem happy with the way that politicians are paying attention to them. That huh? is. I mean, the interesting thing about housing affordability is everyone's kind of coming at that from the same direction. Everyone feels some, like just housing is too expensive. But when we're looking at politicians listening to voters, people agree that this is an important issue, but they agree for different reasons. Mm. Um, some people might feel like the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints kind of steps too far into the political arena. Others feel like politicians are too busy listening to special interest groups or big corporations, um, and, they, and they feel like they're not represented and sometimes it's just people feeling like the loudest voices get heard and everyone else who's just kind of going about their lives and not 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 as focused on politics as, as I am for example sure. um, just get ignored by by all the loud voices yelling at the politicians and that breeds discontent yeah. and potentially worst case scenario uh, disengagement with right. the civic process right yeah yeah uh, let's look at the high importance categories now put them up on your screen for you earning enough to pay for non-housing needs this goes back to affordability mm -hmm. The housing is taking so much money out of paychecks, not a lot left over at the end of the day. And it's not just housing, but I mean, we've seen we've seen some record-breaking inflation over the past mm -hmm. five years. I mean, and things have slowed down if you just look at the, the annual rate of inflation. Um, but still, prices are 20% higher than they were five years ago, and people not, like people haven't quite adjusted to that yet. Right. I know that the governor has his plan for 35,000 new starter homes, hoping to to affect those prices a little bit. Of course, we've been told you're going to need a lot more than 35,000 starter homes to get the prices down and make people feel more confident in the housing market. Right? Yeah. 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 Uh, government overreach. This was interesting. Yep. What you learn here? So again, this was a kind of people coming at this from different directions. Um, you have uh, Democrats who maybe were feeling like um, that the the recent uh, limitations on abortion might might represent government overreach, you know. But you also have Republicans who feel like government the the federal government owning seventy or not seventy but two thirds of Utah's land um, is also kind of the sign of government overreach. But uh, yes, yeah, so you see it at different different groups and also different levels. Yeah, that's very interesting and perhaps. Partisan politics feeds into that a little bit too, yeah. right? Um, you have Republicans who are fed up with with Democrats, and Democrats who uh, wish Republicans would compromise more. And then you have everyone else who's either, you know, in many ways, just unhappy with the the 
the loud disagreement and just wish we could find more compromise moving forward. Yeah. Uh, in fact, being at the political convention uh, recently, the Republican political convention, um, and the Democrats as well, uh, some politicians get flack for working with the other mm -hmm. side, and um, it's so partisan these days. No wonder people have a, an issue with that. Yeah. Uh, and so, like, we, we've talked about kind of these top five issues, and in some ways, like, we try, we, we kind of summarize them by both, like, the cost of living, looking, uh -huh. at, looking at housing affordability and other non-housing needs, and also just political dysfunction, um, looking at these other three categories that we talked about with uh, politicians listening to voters, um, government overreach, and partisan politics. Yeah. It all feeds into the same little bucket there, doesn't yeah. it? Uh, the important category, having enough water other than the Great Salt Lake. We, we broke that out because we also asked people about the Great Salt Lake specifically, which turned out to be one of the least important issues based on, you know, at least out of these top 17. Um, and we think that's partially because it's kind of a more regionalized issue where, and, and it's not, not quite as essential as, as perhaps having enough water to drink. Um, which is uh, an important area even in the wettest parts of the state. Sure. Uh, people are concerned about the schools too. K through 12 education yep. was a big one. And so this is, this, actually this was in seventh place this year and that's a little bit surprising. Normally K-12 education is among the top three ah. historically. So that was kind of a, a big drop and that yeah. was a little bit of a surprise for that. And we're, we're hoping to dive a little bit deeper into the data and figure out why that might be the case. And uh, air quality. That's an important issue, but it didn't rank among the top issues. Here. That we, found that, we found that air quality tends to correlate a little bit with how bad the air is during our survey. Yeah. Uh, so we often do this kind of in the early months, and sometimes there's still some, some uh, bad inversion days, and we find that when that's the case, this tends to, be, this tends to really jump to the top on, the, on those years. In other years, it's, it's still an important issue, but doesn't quite... Uh, beat out the other ones. It's, it's top of mind when it's smoggy Ex out, Exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what did you take away from this survey? What surprised you the most when you looked at the data? When we looked at this data? Um, so, I mean, we have these, these issues to be the top issues, and I guess the one that surprised me most was, was perhaps government, government overreach. Um, it's not something we've ever really asked about, but I was surprised it was uh, one of the top issues. Mm -hmm. um, but, but on top of that, we also asked voters kind of a couple questions to ask how they feel about Get their, get their sentiment on, on how things are going in Utah. And so one of, the, one of those questions is like, how, uh, you know, are you better off than you were five years ago? Mm. Um, and w one of the most surprising things I think was 60% of voters said that they're worse off today than they, were si than they were five years ago. 60% of the voters feel that they're worse off now than they were five years ago. Yeah. That's so a big I mean, number. It is a big number. It's, it's the largest we've ever seen. I mean, so the, we didn't we didn't have that great a share during the Great Recession in 2010 or during like the early years of the wow. early months of the pandemic in in July 2020 when we asked the same question. Um, so really, the past the past five years have, have have not gone well with a lot of Utahns. So where do you hope this data goes next? Do you hope it informs policy? What are you What are your goals for for it now for that you data? have it out? Yeah. Well, we hope that uh, we hope that this really uh, comes up. We hope these issues come up in the view of, of politicians. You know, we hope that the media, like you, you know, take this data and, and use it to ask the politicians. You know, what are we? How are you planning on addressing these issues? Um, you know, and then we're also taking this data internally, and we're going to be publishing uh, further data, just just providing some context on each of these issues. We'll go down these most important issues, and we'll talk about how Utah, how Utahns feel about these issues, and, and maybe what 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 policymakers can do so that Utahns can really be informed when they start acting on this on this information when they when they vote. Yeah, so we should say Utah Foundation is a nonpartisan group. You're looking at these issues, you're looking at the numbers, and then whatever politicians take from it, that's up to them, but you've got the data for them to see. Yep, and we hope to we hope to inform the politicians about what the voters care about and the voters about about the issues that matter most to them. Well, we'll be interested in seeing more research coming and as you look into these issues a little bit deeper too. So fascinating, and I know we just scratched the surface, but we will put a link to the findings on our website, abc4.com, so people can see those and learn more about the, the work that you do. So, Christopher Collard, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. Appreciate on. it. We'll talk to you again soon, I do Sounds hope. Sounds great. Still ahead here on Inside Utah Politics, some mayors across the country are in Washington with hopes to eliminate homelessness. Why they say veteran benefits is one solution to a growing problem. And coming up, Congress keeping a close eye on protests at college campuses. We've been watching that together here. What lawmakers are threatening to do if schools don't crack down on the chaos. A group of nearly 50 mayors are in Washington this week calling on Congress and the White House to do more to help cities manage an epidemic of homelessness. Our Washington, D.C. correspondent Raquel Martin was at their press conference 
and has this story. This is America in the 21st century. No one should be unhoused. Mayors from across the country. Mayor of Minneapolis. Apex, North Carolina. Santa Monica, California. Are in Washington demanding policy changes to address what they describe as a homeless crisis. The number one crisis in America. The group is calling on Congress to prioritize getting veterans off the street. They say many veterans are ineligible for federal housing assistance because their VA benefits put them above the income threshold. And Los Angeles Mayor Karen Bass says too many landlords refuse to take federal housing vouchers. We actually have vacant units and unused vouchers for veterans because of technicality. This week, the mayors are lobbying lawmakers on Capitol Hill and encouraging the White House to cut red tape that blocks veterans and other vulnerable populations from getting the help they need. The group is proudly bipartisan. Half of the big city top 50 Republican mayors in America are standing behind me right now. David Holt, the Republican mayor of Oklahoma City, says Congress needs to take a page out of the mayor's book. Because we know nothing's going to get done up here unless it's bipartisan. The mayors want Congress to change the rules and spend the money to give the homeless veterans a place to call home. In Washington, Raquel Martin. As campus protests escalate, Congress is threatening consequences now. House Republicans are launching an investigation into federal funding for these universities and pushing to pass a new anti-Semitism law. Washington, D.C. correspondent Hannah Brandt tells us why some lawmakers say it's now time to get involved. Fireworks erupted at UCLA and protesters clashed on campus overnight. Across the country at Columbia, New York police stormed a university building to arrest dozens of protesters who had been occupying it. This thing is out of control. From Capitol Hill, lawmakers are watching with concern. And House Speaker Mike Johnson warns if universities don't get the chaos under control. You will see Congress respond in kind. You're going to see funding sources begin to dry up. You're going to see every uh, level of accountability that we can muster. He says several House committees will investigate the protests and may decide to take away federal funding. And this week, Congress is gearing up to vote on a bill to change the federal definition of anti-Semitism under anti-discrimination law. And the rampant anti-Semitism uh, requires action by the federal government. Congressman Mike Lawler introduced the legislation, and supporters say it would allow universities to crack down on harmful speech. This is not the free marketplace of ideas. This is open threats to Jewish students because of their faith and who they are. But some worry it goes too far, like Congresswoman Teresa Ledger Fernandez. We are constitutionally bound to protect free speech, even and more importantly, when it is speech with which we do not agree. And Congressman Pete Aguilar prefers letting universities respond. They have guidance, they have rules, uh, they need to enforce those uh, before Congress creates new ones. That was our Hannah Brandt reporting. The White House says while the president supports peaceful protest, he is concerned about anti-Semitism on campus and does not agree with protesters occupying university buildings. Still to come here on Inside Utah Politics, the U.S. Energy Secretary is here to talk about expanding the power grid across the West. Find out how Utah could be a key player in rolling out that plan. That's next. Inside Utah Politics. Welcome back, everybody. We have a special guest on the show today. We have Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm. It's not normally a, a thing when we have a, a cabinet level official here. Well, so it's an welcome. honor to be here. Thank you so much. What for do you make of me. our great state? Oh my God, it is so magnificent. It is so breathtaking. I'm, um, I'm, I've been here a number of times, and every time it is just almost shocking how gorgeous it is yeah it is a shock to the system when it you is, see it it's beautiful so many people realize that they're moving here mm -hmm. businesses are expanding here more are coming and so you're here today because i want to ask you about building energy capacity yes we need to keep up with the growth yes. right and the department of energy is helping out in building that capacity right correct yeah. correct in fact there's two ways uh, that we are focused on um, building our capacity one is to make the existing grid that we have more resilient and so 
Obviously, this is an area that experiences a lot of wildfires. We want to make sure that the grid is capable of uh, responding when that happens, right? Protecting uh, the grid, hardening it, uh, in some cases undergrounding the wires, in some cases covering them, in some cases adding more efficiencies to the grid. So that's one, one thing, and that's part of what we announced today is that uh, part of the, the president has an Invest in America agenda really focused on investing in infrastructure, and of course, the electricity grid is a big piece of that infrastructure. There's $20 billion associated with shoring up our, our transmission grid and expanding it. So the second piece of what we announced today is how to expand the grid, and so we were uh, glad to say finalizing the negotiations with one company, a transmission company that's going to actually create 4,000 jobs in Utah to, to help us build out that electric grid. So we, we want to make sure we, we harden the grid from extreme weather events and expand the grid. And both of those were part of the announcements that we had today. You talk about expanding the grid. This is a transmission line running from Idaho through Utah and into Nevada. Yes, yeah. yes. That's one of the pieces. Actually, we had two uh, projects that we were announcing today. One doesn't touch Utah, um, but is connected to the sure. to that one that we just talked about right so it connects all of these big pieces you know we have such a need in this country to have a national grid and we, we've got all of these pockets of con connectivity but they don't connect together and so if for example Utah needed uh, you know to have power sent to it in the case of an emergency you want to make sure you have those those lanes open which would be transmission lines and that's true around the country so that's one thing is to make sure that we've got enough capacity but it's also because we are adding, as you noted at the beginning, new manufacturing, new um, data centers for AI, et cetera, electrification of vehicles. So there's going to be additional power, and therefore we have to have additional transmission as well. So talk about additional power. Mm -hmm. And we hear so much about clean energy yes. and the transition to clean energy, right? There's a facility here in Utah, Utah Forge. Yes. And I don't know how many of our audience members know about this, but it's a research project that the Department of Energy is invested in, that University of Utah is invested in and this is enhanced geothermal right what does that mean for those of us who don't follow energy policy okay, so, religiously? <laughs> so geothermal is the heat beneath our feet right. right and there I mean depending on how far down you go you can access that heat but Forge and Utah has unique assets because the heat beneath our feet is closer to the surface. And so if you go down to get that geothermal power, of course, heat can spin a turbine and create electricity. And in this case, it is abundant, it is renewable, it, it is, you know, inexhaustible, and it's, it's a form of clean power. It doesn't create any carbon pollution. So you've got a unique asset here in Utah to create that clean, renewable power. And that's why Forge, which is a project with DOE has been so focused on it and there's a company now that is um, also locating adjacent to Forge called Fervo which is a private sector company doing enhanced geothermal as well let me just say enhanced because you know it used to be that you would do a big old uh, you know d bore hole and straight down straight down yeah. but now with the new technologies associated with oil and gas fracking for example hydraulic fracking you can use that same technique to be able to pull up geothermal so that's um, that's a real advance uh, in geothermal technology, and it's one that we're very bullish about. We're seeing some. Uh, we just saw some video there of the Forge facility, and I wonder what is the place of enhanced geothermal in the energy future of the country, yeah. right? Because this is you're researching it right now and developing techniques. Well, it's it's yeah. there. I mean, yeah. that that's the thing is geothermal. It's really the capital cost of doing a major geothermal project that is the barrier, right? So we want to bring down those capital costs because the technology itself is not new technology. It works. It is clean baseload power, and that's what we're all striving for. So, but we also, of course, looking at um, um, solar, looking at wind, again, Utah very abundant yes. in those, <laughs> hydroelectric power, nuclear power. We want zero carbon emitting sources to be able to take us forward. We have a goal of getting to 100% clean electricity by 2035 and then net zero by 2050. 
um, you know, we want to take away all of the uh, air particulate matter that happens when you burn coal, for example, that's bad for your health. It's also bad for the planet. So if we can su supplement that with clean power that is homegrown power, that's a win-win-win. Energy well, security. Well, that leads me to my next question. We talk about liquefied natural gas, mm -hmm. right? This is for our audience. This is natural gas that's been chilled, liquefied, typically put on container ships and exported to other countries right. or used domestically. Uh, President Biden issued a pause earlier this year on approvals for new exports mm -hmm. of LNG, right? Uh, I want to show you a tweet from our representative in Congress, John Curtis, if I can. He said this, it is inconceivable why the Biden administration would put a pause on LNG exports when countries are begging for affordable, reliable, and clean, hashtag nat gas. So President Biden has got a lot of criticism for this. What can you tell us about that yeah, decision? This is a, uh uh, just for the length of time it takes our national labs to do an update on what we are required to do, which is a study, to see whether approvals of additional natural gas are in the public interest. And when I say that, um, we are the largest exporter of natural gas in, in the world. And none of that gets touched by this update. None of the stuff that's already been approved. In fact, we're the largest in the world, and we've already approved three times more what we're already exporting. So, so we're, not, not, we're not pausing we're not the exports. We're not pausing here. the exports okay. at all. And it's just for the purpose of allowing our national labs to do a study on what's in, in our interest. So part of that is if you export half of your uh, natural gas, what does that do to prices at home? And that's an important question, um, and it's one worth looking at. The second is, what what is the importance of natural gas for our allies? To the congressman's uh, point, we want to make sure that our allies are well supplied with energy. We want to help them keep the lights on. Um, so that's a component of it. What are the country's plans with respect to the country's stated plan all in the, in the globe? You know, everybody's trying to get to net zero by 2050. So what does that look like in terms of time frame? Uh, you know, is it going to be building out stranded assets or is this something that's going to be necessary because of projections of need of natural gas? And then what's the greenhouse gas uh, emission footprint of those LNG terminals? So those are all the things that the labs are looking at. Um, this study is done periodically. This is one of those periodic times. And once that study is complete, you know, hopefully the end of this year-ish, um, you know, things will go back to, you know, approvals, et cetera, conditioned upon what's in the public interest. We talk about fossil fuels, uh, natural gas, which is methane or coal or other oil uh, uh, derivatives. And we know that climate change human-caused climate change is caused by carbon building up in the atmosphere mm -hmm. from the use of those substances, mm -hmm. right? So this brings about the transition to cleaner, renewable energy. But there are some who would like to see that transition move a lot faster, mm -hmm. and there are others who would like to see it roll out more slowly, right? How do you balance the need to Such move a good question. to cleaner energy versus where we're at with baseline power needs and an industry that may not be able to turn on a dime. Yeah, this is such an important question because the goal is, and it's not just the U.S., it's all these other countries too that have signed on to getting to net zero, meaning net zero carbon pollution by 2050, right? So we've got a good number of decades, we have, you know, two and a half decades to go before we get there. Um, it's also net zero. So there is some recognition that fossil fuels are going to need to be in the mix going into the future. But the fewer fossil fuels we have, the less carbon pollution we have. And all of these extreme weather events that we're seeing are exacerbated, of course, by carbon pollution, by climate change. And so we want to accelerate this transition to clean even as we keep the lights on. And that balance is what we are, you know, navigating every single day. It's what the utilities are navigating. We know that we've got solutions for that clean base load power. When I say base load, I mean power that is sure, it's reliable. We know we've got solutions for that. It's just a question of how we, as a nation, um, commit to investing in funding those solutions. Um, you know, as the Department of Energy, we have 17 national laboratories. We're really a science agency, and we're doing all sorts of work in researching these solutions, both in getting the price down, but also in what are the next generation solutions for that clean energy future. I'm very bullish on technology helping us to, to get there, but I'm also bullish on deploy, deploy, deploy the technologies that we already have to get us to 100% clean electricity by 2035. Okay, we'll be watching. Secretary Jennifer Granholm, appreciate your time. You Thank bet. you. Good so talking with to you. Be. Thanks. All right. Stay with us, everybody. Inside Utah Politics continues right after this.
Thank you so much for joining us here on Inside Utah Politics. You can find ABC4 on social media to follow along no matter where you are. And while you're at it, why don't you download the ABC4 News app. News, headlines, weather, and politics with you wherever you are. Thanks for being with us, everybody. We will see you next week.